Everyman Driver Nation, I have good news and bad news about this week's test vehicle. This is the 2017 Mitsubishi Outlander Sport. The bad news is, you wanna go bad news or good news? I guess it's my choice. Bad news is there's only three new elements new this year. There is a standard, here it is, shark fin antenna, that's now standard for 2017. There is standard automatic climate control on the inside. There's also upgraded seat interior on the ES, which is the lowest trim level. There are four trim levels, ES, SE, SEL, and GT. We have the SEL right here, and all of them except the GT come in two-wheel and all-wheel control. The GT only comes in all-wheel control. All right, most of that's out of the way. The good news is, I'll tell you inside the car. I'm gonna go for a ride here and give you my impressions from the week because my time is up, but I've got some good stuff and I wanna do some, uh, also some show and tell on the inside and around. Okay, let's go. So here we are on the inside. We're doing my research to get some more information for you. This is the fifth time I have reviewed this vehicle. I started back in 2013 and now we're up here to 2017. So this is a compact SUV. It's got some decent ground clearance. I've gone off road in this a couple of times. It's probably why I didn't do it this time. Uh, 8.5 inches of ground clearance. So if you wanna see what the Outlander Sport can do off road, just uh, do some searching here on my YouTube channel and you'll find that. Uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, go for our drive. We'll talk about the engine and the really, really good news that I've discovered in my week of driving. And I have put, where is it at? 430 miles on the car. So. That's a hint on some of the good news I'm about to report to you. There is a 6.1 inch display here, which has a backup camera. A navigation package is optional. We don't have that here on our SL, SEL. Again, there's four trim levels and the price point, I'm gonna say the price point to the end because that's also one of the great selling points of this vehicle. Two really good ones that I've discovered. Uh, price is one of them, kind of gave that one away, right? But I'll give you the numbers here a little bit. Other one is fuel economy. Uh, there are two engine options. There's a two liter inline four cylinder. There's a 2.4 liter inline four cylinder. Now that two liter inline four cylinder is available on the ES and that gets 148 horses, 145 pound feet of torque. Engine power, not very impressive with this car. Now that 2.4 liter, which we have here, 168 horses, 167 pound feet of torque. And I'll talk about competition, but I'll just bring up the Ford. I think it's the Escape right now that's what they start off with and this one starts off with 148 so challenging when it comes to its competition in this compact suv category uh, five speed manual and a sportronic cvt are your transmission options this takes only unleaded fuel I used to do that all the time when i was uh, going to the hood i'd show you uh, the, uh, the engine bay and then i'd tell you what kind of fuel was recommended it's just unleaded fuel all right Best case scenario with fuel economy is 23 city, 29 highway. That's the best case. That's your ES two wheel drive, uh, two liter inline four cylinder. We have 22 city, 27 highway for ours. Now, yesterday I just wrapped up a, a lot of highway driving, but I've been you know, driving around town as well. At 333 miles, 0.7, I had to fill up the tank. My average, 26.5. Mitsubishi is looking for 24 in mixed driving. We average 26.5 miles per gallon in mixed driving over 330 miles of driving. Impressive, that was an average of 52 miles per hour too. So I got all those stats. I wanted to keep track of it throughout the week and that's what I had now. I put another 100 miles on it and my fuel economy because of those extra 100 miles. Oh, it reset. Darn it. I'm glad I kept track of it. So it was 26.5. Holy cow. Was I doing something wrong? Doing something right? That's really good. So I, I, I had to make note of that. That's the huge selling point on my driving experience this week. So above and beyond what Mitsubishi was hoping for. So 
big thumbs up there. Okay, let's move on to uh, the back seat legroom and headroom. And for that, I'm getting out of the car. I'm gonna show you that right now. So what's it like for a guy who's 5'11 to get the back of the Outlander Sport? Well, first of all, I am 5'11. I have been for a long time. I still, it just can't grow any further. Uh, so here's my leg room behind the back row seats. This is my driving position, of course. And just a little bit of room, not a whole bunch, but a little bit of room. It does feel like this, uh, this bench seat is raised a little higher versus a little bit lower. Uh, comfort wise, a little stiff. Seems to be okay. Uh, headroom. Nothing super impressive, nothing stands out to me. Uh, one thing I'm gonna start adding to my reviews is passenger volume. I do talk about cargo volume, but passenger volume in this vehicle is 97.5 cubic feet. So that's how much room they say you have with all the adjustability between the front seats and the back seat. So I don't know how you really equate that to people size, but this is a five passenger uh, SUV. Uh, there are four O-blank handles all the way around. I do wish there was a sliding sunroof here or even one panoramic would be nice, but that's what we have here in the SEL trim level. Nothing too special in the back. There's no plug-ins for USB ports. There's no heated seats. There are heated seats for the driver and passenger. Uh, that's one nice little feature up there they have in this, this uh, trim level. Fold down armrest, two cup holders there, no pass through. Uh, slide over, the seat gets a little more firm in the center. Depends on how much room this person has here. You may have to uh, make some adjustments for your knees because right now this seat is pushed back uh, maybe an inch and a half and now my knee is pressed up against it whereas this one is just the way it is. Okay, so head's about touching the roof line. Wish there was a taller roof in it, but that's the reality. There is a compartment behind the driver's seat, but not the passenger seat. Sometimes that's swapped. Kind of odd, isn't it? Okay, that's all I got for here. All right, time for a little bit of cargo volume demo. And for that, I'm gonna keep on driving here because I'm not done with my errands. So behind that back row of seats, you're looking at 21.7 cubic feet of volume. And I am using myself as the demo. See how I get in the car, isn't that nice? Now you can fold these seats down, which are a 60-40 split. You increase it to 49.5 cubic feet of, of uh, cargo volume in the back. Pretty good, you know, compact SUV, you wanna have plenty of space. And I think this space is very useful. You can utilize it pretty well. I was able to put a, I think it was a three by or four by five whiteboard back there and it fit. And I've also been storing or hauling some camera equipment, some a light kit. And of course, groceries are no problem. I even put Max back there one time. So it's all good to go with cargo volume. That's a good thing. Now listen to this compact SUV rival lineup with the Outlander Sport. Ford Escape, Jeep Compass, Kia Sportage, Subaru Crosstrek, and the Nissan Juke. That's a stacked field. Exterior wise, boy, it's, it's really hard to compete with some of those other vehicles. I mean, I love the way the Subaru Crosstrek looks, even though they don't make a XV anymore. Uh, Kia Sportage, it's got some great things on the inside that this one does not. What I'd say about the interior of the Sportage, uh, the, not the Sportage, but um, the Sport, is vanilla. Nothing super exciting about it. When I step in the car, I'm not going, ooh, wow. You know, there's no oohs and ahs. You know, this six inch, 6.1 inch navigation screen, well, it's touch screen here. Uh, these dials, these circular dials, I remember when I was, I was at Ford and they were doing some demos on how they were designing the Ford F-150. This is just an example. Not that this is a Ford 150 or anything like that, but they were putting gloves on people and saying, how easy is it to turn the, the knobs on the F-150 on their entertainment systems? Well, these knobs here are very hard to turn even with your normal fingers. Can you imagine if you had gloves what it might be like to turn those. So I think those could be a little bit bigger, maybe some grip on them. They're kind of smooth right here. And the color scheme, the, the graphics, a little outdated. I don't know, just this needs a little bit of uplifting. And it's kind of just, again, vanilla, meaning it's okay for just about everybody. For bang for your buck, it's a good deal because price point is very economical. You can get into one of these cars for just under $20,000, a little over 20,000. 
when you have to pay the shipping and handling and, and tax and destination fees. And then right around 28,000 at the top. And then you can add some packages onto it like the navigation, other different packages and stuff. So price point is pretty decent to get in, but I think they need to work on the interior to make it a little more, little more user friendly, a little more exciting. That's, that's what I'm thinking. And the drive, you wanna know what the driving impressions Hey, it zips around, you know, a little quick little car, but it is lacking some of that punch. Uh, I don't like, I don't really personally use paddle shifters very much, so that's not a big selling point for me. You may want to, but the CVT, eh, it's okay. I mean, I don't have the five-speed manual because that's in the ES trim level, but I'm working with the CVT, which has Sportstronic, so that's fine. And oh, I don't think I've ever mentioned this yet. There are four different drive modes, or, or I guess there's two-wheel drive. There's four wheel automatic and then there's four wheel lock. That's where that all wheel control comes into place. And I was driving around town a little bit and uh, I was concerned about the snow and the slush. So I, I made sure I just pushed the button down and to put it into four wheel lock, which I did utilize when I went off road in previous uh, versions of this car in, in past years. So driving around town, you know, it's it just plain Jane. Not a bad way, not a good way, just plain Jane, right down the middle. All right, I think that's gonna wrap it up for my, my week of driving the Outlander Sport, my fifth time. So thank you to Mitsubishi for loaning me the car. I'm looking forward to the, the updates in 2018 to see what they've done, uh, because economically and fuel economy wise, this car right there where it should be. Competition though is pretty stiff in this compact SUV category. Come on, for anyone who's in this category, it's gonna be tough. and so the bar is, is really high with the other vehicles I mentioned. So no, no real knock against Mitsubishi. It's just that uh, they've got some room to grow. How about that? Okay, uh, thanks again for watching. I'm Dave Erickson, adios. Hey guys, it's Dave. I just wanna say thanks once again for supporting Everyman Driver and watching my videos. Can you do me a small favor? The next time you're in the market for a new or used car and wanna schedule a test drive or just wanna get a really great price quote, from a dealership of your choice in your zip code, click on the link below and fill out a short form. It's car.show forward slash everyman driver. Now it's totally free to you and there's no obligation whatsoever to buy or lease anything. It's just a quick and easy way for you to help support my work and keep this channel going. There's also a free phone number, 844-765-0610, and you can talk to a car segment specialist for car shopping advice and direction. That call is also free to you. The link again, car.show forward slash everyman driver. I'd really appreciate it. Thanks again.